I'm here tonight to share the story of the grace of God in my life, and that's a very, very great personal honor. Fifty-five years ago, as a very much younger man, in fact, as a teenager, I met Jesus Christ at the crossroads of life, going to hell at the speed of a fast train. Jesus stepped across my path. I did not invite him to do so per se. I was not expecting it either to occur. But I want you to know that in a moment of time, the story that we were singing about in the opening hymn about being on the storm-tossed sea and about being rescued. That was very, very much my story. If the truth be told, I should have been in hell tonight or this evening. I should have been groveling, and I should be weeping amongst the damned and that inferno that I endeavored to talk a little about last Sunday evening. And if it had not been for the grace of God, that most certainly is where I would have been. I had th at least three very, very close brushes with death, and any one of them could have taken me out of the scene of time. I was involved in a road traffic accident when my drunken father was behind the wheel, and I could have been killed that night, but I wasn't. I stepped into a swollen river as wild and daring teenagers are in the habit of doing, seeing how close to the edge of the river I could get without falling over the edge, and I took that fateful step too many and went over the edge of that swollen river. And I want to tell you with the utmost sincerity and with no added uh, gloss on it, if it had not been for a little bush, I think it was a blackthorn, but I didn't mind the thorns. I caught a hold on that little blackthorn bush, just a few feet high, and it was sufficiently anchored to hold me with the current trying to take control of me and carry me off to what would have been a sure death. Time enough for my older brother John to come, wading, wading through the water, grabbing a hold of me and pulling me to safety. When I went home with my clothes all drenched and my mother learned what had happened, she said, God must have a purpose for you. that he spared your life today. I knew nothing about those things, and my mother did not know much either, because she was not a believer then. And on another occasion, coming from the country and operating farm machinery, I was traveling along a very narrow embankment. It was fine and safe, but I was trying to avoid the ruts and I went over the edge on the tractor. And again, mercifully, the angels of God somehow, in an amazing manner, did not like let the vehicle or the machine, the tractor, go over the edge. There were other occasions, but God was good. I'm very, very, very merciful. I remember as a boy of 12 hearing the voice of God. I did not know it at the time, but there's no doubt in God spoke. I had been attending 
a Church of Ireland Sunday school where I did not hear the gospel, but in a little hall in the village attending a children's meeting, and I was the most disruptive and the most untamable human being of quite tender years that ever came near the place. But I heard and I memorized portions of the Word of God, also in a local gospel hall. So I'd heard, I'd heard scriptures, and they registered with me. And that day, as I came in to the sitting room in our farmhouse, I glanced at a picture that was up on my left-hand side, and I know I'm pointing to you from the right. I read this scripture on the front of the picture, and I had no reason to do so. I had no reason to be in the room that day or at that time, but I was. And it was as if the picture lit up. And I read these words, which I'd memorized in that gospel hall Sunday school, which I also attended as a younger boy. John 3 and 3. Except a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, I'm extending it a little bit to incorporate everybody in the meeting, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I knew no theology. I could not understand even the surface truth of any text, but a voice said to me that day, if you are ever to be in heaven, something must happen between you and God. You must get rightly related to God. It was as clear as that. Why, I trembled. I'd heard the voice of God, and I didn't know it. If only I had obeyed, I could have saved myself a lot of tears and sorrow and grief and pain and regret and memories which I preferred, I would have preferred I didn't have. God spoke, and the impression lingered. I am the third of a family of 14 children, seven boys, seven girls. I was brought up in a drunkard's home. And I have vivid memories, and today as I talk to you 55 years on since Jesus met with me, I hear voices and I see images that I will never forget. My mother being beaten within an inch of her life, sometimes when she was pregnant. I remember that old coat hanger that was in our hallway. It was tall, and it was a tough uh, transjeopardy for hanging coats on. I think every peg on it, every hook, was broken, because my mother was slammed against it so often. There were times when she could not go out to do her shopping for weeks because she was so black and bruised and hurt. She was treated in a very brutal fashion by my father. And I used to think to myself, when I get older and I get stronger, I will make sure that 
there's a payback time for my father for what he did. When I got older and stronger, I'm always grateful that I never did anything. I would have regretted it. We got it also for no reason. The older members of our family particularly um, were very roughly handled. And sometimes my father, in a drunken stupor, not realizing what he was doing, he kicked us and he beat us with his fists around the house. I want you to know, my dear people, that the way of the transgressor is hard, <coughs> And those who come in the way of the drunken transgressor have a very tough time of it too. I have memories of drinking my tea out of a jam jar. You know, in a drunkard's home, there are not many comforts. Quite often when we would go to bed at night, our blankets had buttons. I think you will understand what that means. For days, the only food we had was dry bread with sugar sprinkled on the top. We were so grateful for the sugar, but there wasn't much of it. It was very, very tough, and it was a mercy that we survived. There were times I remember, and I say it with a little twinge, in fact, a big bit of shame uh, I had no shoes to wear. Never went to school that way, but about home and the fields, I was on my bare feet. It's interesting that I landed in Africa by the grace of God. Uh, things are changing there, but when I landed there in 2002, and I would go to visit schools to preach the Word of God, and I would see a thousand or two thousand children, and not one of them had a pair of shoes. And sometimes they would talk to me, and they would wonder uh, uh, if I could understand how it was with them. In fact, it wasn't really, it wasn't really a problem to them. They preferred to be barefooted, even when playing football. Uh, the boys, that is. But they thought I didn't know anything about a life without shoes until I started to tell them my story and where I came from. Why, they thought I'd come from Buckingham Palace in London. They thought I was brought up by somebody really wealthy who at least owned one or two banks. They thought I had never been in one, but once I told them, I used, I used also to go around with no shoes on my feet. They looked at me and they wondered if could that be? Coming from the United Kingdom? We thought the United Kingdom was heaven and that everybody was well catered for there. But it gave them a new respect and appreciation for myself. I thank God for those who prayed for me. If I had taken a little longer, I would have read some verses from Acts chapter 16, but I'm not going to take time to do that. The passage is so well known. The entire book of the Acts is a book of conversions. It's an amazing book. And the chapter 16 has got three very remarkable conversions. That of the Philippian jailer, as we call him, or prison officer, the teenager called a damsel uh, who was demon-possessed. She had powers to tell fortunes. And then there was a successful, probably mid middle-aged, wealthy business lady called Lydia. If you study that passage carefully, there was a prayer factor in each of those conversions. The young lady whose name is not given, who was demon-possessed. The servants of God were on their way to a prayer meeting. 
This lady had been harassing them every day for weeks. Do you think her name had been mentioned in prayer? <laughs> You'd better believe it. She was one, I'm sure, that was the most prayed for. Lydia was in a prayer meeting when she heard Paul speak. In a prayer meeting. And that's where she found Jesus. Wonderful place to get saved in a prayer meeting. And then the Philippian jailer, or prison officer, he heard Paul and Silas <clears throat> uh, praying and, and singing in the prison, even though their backs were hurting because they had been stripped of their clothes and they'd been brutally beaten. And that was a crime, particularly for them to beat Paul because he was a Roman citizen. He prayed. And uh, I, I'm sure that he didn't forget, as he prayed for prisoners on either side of him and throughout the prison, he didn't forget the man that was at the gate who was charged on the pain of death to make sure that these men did not escape. He prayed so there was a prayer factor. And I believe that in the case of everybody who comes to Christ, there's a prayer factor. I mentioned that in the village there was a gospel hall, and my father was very well known. He used to attend that gospel hall. And our family was targeted, targeted in prayer. There was not a gospel mission held in that place, but my father and our family was prayed for. And there was a car at the gate, and there was an invitation. Transport laid on, come to the meetings. And we came from time to time. And I'm saying the continued praying. And in the little hall where our family were taken, so that my mother could get a break for an hour and a half, by the time we got home, there was prayer that was wont to be made for the Edgerton family in the Deer Park, a mile and a half outside of town. And when I came to Christ, and that's the central part of my story that I'm coming to in a moment, that was key. That was key. On the other side of town, my father had a younger brother, also a farmer. And to this day, to my knowledge, not one of that large family also have come to Christ. I was the first to come. When I got born again by the amazing, marvelous, wonderful, glorious grace of God, Jesus got into our home. And with the change that came about in my life, there were other major changes that came about in the family by the grace of God. But I am saying one family untouched, no prayer. The other family, which was in many ways more deprived and uh, more uh, desperate in a way, God got a foothold and miracles began to happen. What I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony regarding God sparing my life, I refer to that as the providence of God. God in His providence spared my life. And there's a providential factor in all of those stories in Acts chapter 16 that led to the miracle of God's saving power in the lives of those individuals. And I want to say and emphasize, because I'm here tonight, not to uh, impose my life story on you or to in any way um, promote myself. I'm here primarily to promote Jesus. And if I don't succeed in doing that, glorifying his beautiful name, I have failed. I have fa I've wasted my time and yours in coming. And so I want to say that the miracle of miracles is the new birth. The greatest miracle that God can perform is to take a sinner 
out of the very clamp of hell and sin and the devil and to save him or her, <laughs> to transform him or her, and to plant their feet on the rock and to give them grace to walk straight and clean and in a glorifying manner to God and one day to not just meet the Savior at heaven's gate, but to be invited inside by the wonderful grace of God. Oh, my dear people, the element of the miraculous is in that Acts 16 chapter. The power of God, the grace of God, the salvation of God is all there. There's a dynamic to the new birth that my words could never exhaust or explain fully. And I have been the object of that. I may not be able to tell it well, but have I, I've experienced it fully, absolutely. In the spring of 1966, a gospel mission came to our village, a nationalist village called Rosley, on the border with Monacan. And um, our home was almost, almost right on the border in a little almost cul-de-sac. But a mission came. Wasn't God so good to send Mr. Evangelist in the person of Christy Irwin? Some of you know him. And thank God he's still alive, not in good health, but alive and uh, rejoicing in God, living over in Market Hill. Christy is a young man in his 20s, came to the little Irish evangelistic band hall and began to preach. I didn't know he was coming, didn't know there were meetings on. I don't know how I found out. I didn't really know what was meant. Uh, to happen in the meetings, I was totally, totally um, uh, uninformed or ignorant about what the meetings were about. But I knew a lot of people were going. The little hall was full to capacity most every night. And almost every night somebody was getting saved. The wind of God was blowing. <laughs> Dear people, when the wind of God starts to blow, it's a very, very exciting time. It's nice to be around when that's happening. I pray that the wind of God will blow until it becomes a mighty storm right here in this community and in this house of God. Wouldn't it be marvelous? A nationalist village in the mid of the 1960s gospel being preached, and a lot of young people in their teens and early twenties repenting and coming to know Jesus Christ. I began to attend those meetings. Somebody invited me, and uh, I began to um, attend. And I'd heard about some people that I knew getting saved, meeting with Jesus. And something spoke into my life and said, that is what you need to do. Now, I come to the unpleasant part of my story. As a young man, I was untamable and untrainable. I was a madman, daring in sin. Nothing I would not do. Any challenge put to me, I was your man. Perhaps it was because I wanted to please or because I wanted um, the enjoyment of succeeding in some devilment or other. I say to my shame, and I address everybody here tonight, and particularly younger people, I was a thief and I'm not proud of it. I stole everything that was not nailed down. I had a fascination 
I remember I stole a Bible one time at school. And there was such a commotion made about that Bible. And there were so many inquiries made about it. I got convicted. <laughs> I didn't understand that word. I did not know what was wrong with me. I was afraid of being found out. So, you will understand, I had a conscience. When you feel guilty, you have a conscience. When you are afraid of being found out, <laughs> that's proof you have a conscience. When you're nervous about the wrongdoing you've done, you, that's proof you've got a conscience. And I remember sneaking that Bible stealthily, carefully, one day to the cloakroom. And I left it in a not too obvious a place, but I left it where it could be found. Imagine stealing the Word of God that said, Thou shalt not steal. It, it was the only thing I returned, that is, before I got converted. I say also to my shame, may I just pause to say to you young people as well, about stealing, there was not one thing that I stole that made me any richer, or that prospered me, or that stayed with me for very long. It seemed like that my pockets had holes. It seemed that either somebody stole it from me or I lost it. It never did me any good. And just in case you don't know, that is how it is with the dishonest, deceitful, thieving, a regular life of ungodliness. That was my way of life, and I'm ashamed of it. But another terrible dishonor and grief I have is that I was a liar, a compulsive liar. I told some of the most shocking and amazing stories and how I would manage to concoct them. Some of them were believed and some of them weren't, but I was an inveterate liar. And if you've got a spirit of telling lies, for sure the devil's in you. And the devil has got a handle on your life. And he's not taking you to a good place. And it's only the beginning. It gets worse. A liar. And also, I'm desperately ashamed to say that I was a blasphemer. I wish I could pause for a moment to weep and shed a few tears without you seeing me. But I blasphemed that lovely name of the Lord Jesus. Many, 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 many times. I am so ashamed that I profaned and that I blasphemed the Son of God. The Lord knows how sorry this poor man is as he stands in this pulpit tonight. I am ashamed, ashamed. I was as bad as any drunken sailor at blaspheming. And the strings of blasphemy would have frightened you. There were things you might be surprised I didn't do, but there were enough bad things. I was constantly in fights. I was a scrapper nearly every day. I think that my headmaster, particularly at secondary school, he almost uh, exhausted a total forest of dowel rods on my rear end. But it did no good. It did no good. I got more hidings at school than I could count or even remember. And I deserved every one of them. So you will understand that when I found Jesus, <laughs> there were a whole lot of people in various institutions that were mighty glad. And it was very easy for them to see the change. My parents, although they were ungodly, my father a drunkard, they trembled 
because they could do nothing with me. I was breaking into houses. I was carrying property away, doing all manner of things. Being a teenager, I was still at school, and the teachers were, they were distracted. Nearly every day in class, there was war. War. I was a menace to the teachers. And they wondered, how on earth are we going to make progress with anybody, with this madman in class? It was nearly, at least, uh, that, that's my take on it. I needed, I needed a miracle. And the only one who can perform miracles is the mighty Son of God, better known as the Lord Jesus Christ, the man with the marks of the nails in his hands and feet and the marks of the thorns on his brow. He was looking for me. I didn't know it. Just like that wee man Jer uh, that was in Jericho, uh, he was looking for Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus was looking for him. And there's some people in this meeting tonight, and you don't know it, but Jesus is looking for you. And he's been looking for you for a long time. So you stop your hiding and come out into the open. You'd better surrender now. You'll save yourself a lot of heartaches and a lot of pain and trouble. Come out of the woodwork. Come out from onto the bench and say, I'm here, I'm here. What do you want to do with me? Jesus was looking for me. And that night I went to the meeting. I can't remember a thing about the sermon. Just the deep impression I needed to seek the Lord. I'd like to think that I have mastered a major part of biblical theology and taught a great deal of it in the many years I've been in the Lord's work and in ministry. But I'm telling you, I didn't have a modicum, not a modicum, not a tiny piece of theology. All I knew, I was a bad boy, a bad rascal, and I needed Jesus. And the amazing thing about it all too, Jesus wasn't angry with me. He wasn't looking for me to beat me or to punish me. He was looking for me because he loved me. And that's why he's looking for you tonight in this meeting. He loves you and he wants to do you good. The best good that you could ever imagine. And the more, the sooner you get saved and get right with God, the sooner you'll begin to enjoy that goodness and that wonderful grace of God. Oh, I praise God for that night. It was the second day of March. I couldn't wait for the end of the meeting to come, and there was an appeal made. And I said, I'm here. I'm here. I'm sitting two seats from the back at half past nine of the clock. I prayed the first prayer I ever, 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 ever remember praying. Those situations I talked to you about, those difficulties that could have snuffed out my life, it never occurred to me I could pray and call upon the name of the Lord. That night I prayed a simple prayer, confessing my sins. And I extended an invitation to the glorious Son of God to come into my life and to change me and to save me by His grace. <laughs> and I want you to know, dear people, tonight something happened. Something happened. Feel like jumping over the pulpit, but I would embarrass some of you and possibly more my wife. Something happened. I passed from death unto life, from the power of Satan unto God. I, I transferred from the broad road that leads to destruction to the narrow way that leads to the celestial city. Oh, glory to God. 
about the miracle of salvation. Any wonder we sing, O oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior and my God? Well, may this glowing heart rejoice and tell its raptures all abroad. Happy night, happy night, when Jesus washed my black heart white. He taught me how to sing and shout and to live for Jesus out and out. Amen. Oh, my dear friends, that night my sister Elizabeth, who became a nurse, and who died in 1974 of cancer. She gave her life to Christ. And the two of us walked out of the meeting, up through the village of Rosley, and out into the country, home. And we talked about heaven, the whole road. Never did that in my life before. Never did that before. And when I got home, I remember stepping over the door. Our house was being renovated at the time, so my parents were in the sitting room. They weren't in the habit of sitting there. Normally it was in the kitchen, beside the stove, but they were in the sitting room. And I walked in through the sitting room door, and my father was sitting over there uh, in front of me, and my mother was sitting right beside the fire here, just behind the door. And I had an announcement to make. I said, I've got saved tonight. Give my heart to Jesus. I don't know why I stand, stood so close to the door. It may have been I wanted to make a quick getaway because my father had no great interest in the things of God. But you know, there was a silence in the room. Nobody said anything, bad or good. But I know, secretly, my father and my mother were hoping, hope he's telling the truth, because he really needs, he really needs a change. They needed to change too, but they were hoping I really had got myself sorted out. And I'm glad both of them did later on. When Jesus gets through the front door of your house, you know he has come in to make a clean sweep and given him time and prayer and an exercise of faith. That's exactly what he did. So I left the room and I did something interesting. And if you want a string of proofs of the grace of God, talking about heaven the whole way from the meeting, never going there and what heaven was like and being ready to, to meet the Lord there. That was, that was awesome, looking back on it, although it seemed rather natural at the time. A man, a boy, who was always cursing, swearing. And then to go into the house and announce to your family who were ungodly, I've met Jesus, I've got saved. <laughs> and then the third thing, I started a search in the house for a Bible. I wanted the Bible. Where could I find a Bible? Didn't ask anybody. Went, looked in cupboards, went, looked under beds. I went and looked round the upstairs. I'm looking for a Bible. And when I got a copy of the Word of God, I knelt down at my bedside and I opened it and I called God Father. And I began to read from that book. And for 55 years, I read from that book every day, morning and evening. Morning and evening. Morning and evening. I've read from that book. I've read it almost the number of times that represent the years that have got saved, been saved. I asked the Lord to keep me and to lead me on from this point and to take care of me because it didn't know what was ahead of me. The next morning I got up, I plumped 
down beside my bed on my knees. And I read the Scriptures, and again I called God Father. You remember it was said of the Apostle Paul, when some maybe were questioning the genuineness of his salvation, they said, Behold, he prayeth. If you want proof of the Spirit of God in you, Jesus living in your life, there it is. Behold, she prayeth. Nobody has to drive you to it, but you feel you must talk to your Father in heaven. And then I boarded the bus when I got my, got my chores attended to and got straightened out, landed in school in Lisnesky, about 12 or 14 miles away. And you know what? <clears throat> I don't know if it was put in the newspaper. Nobody would have bought it anyway that early, but the news had got there before I got there that uh, Rooster had got saved. That was my nickname. I had a head of fiery red hair. Rooster has got saved. So that was the talk of the school. And I go to class. I remember where it was. It was in the social studies room. Uh, and the teacher was a Mr. McWig. He's still alive. And he was marking the roll. And there were 40 in the class. And uh, he was marking off the names by one after another. And then he came to my name and he stopped. And he said, Edgerton, I hear you've got saved. Is it true? He invited me to come out in front of the class. I said, sir, it's true. And he was an opportunist, and he followed that up quickly with another question. He says, Edgerton, does that mean I'm going to have no more trouble with you? Because the poor man needed to be paid danger money when I came into his class. No more trouble. I said, sir, that's how it's going to be. And you know what? I never asked it, asked for it. Uh, I never expected it. And had I known it was going to happen that way, it probably wouldn't have shown up in school that day. But you know, by being put on the spot like that, he nailed me to the wall. He put my testimony in a high place. Everybody knew that this rascal, who was so full to overflowing of devilment, Hopefully, they were going to see a difference. And I want to tell you that a new boy started school that day. I went back to school years later, and I was given red carpet treatment. And I remember one of the teachers who knew me well, introducing me to a class years and years afterwards. You know, this gentleman used to come here as a pupil, and he was an impossible boy. We couldn't control him. He was untamable. Then something happened, she said. She couldn't go any further. And I, I said, excuse me, uh, uh, Miss Morrison or Mrs. Morrison. She was Morrison who married Morrison. She was Mrs. now. I said, I met Jesus. And he changed me. And he made me a new person. And that's why I'm here after all these years. And God began to lead me step by step. I never knew that there was such a meeting as a prayer meeting. And the Tuesday following the close of the mission, that's where I found myself. I was so ignorant of Christian things. I wondered what they did in a prayer meeting. Richard, can you imagine? <laughs> what did they do in a prayer meeting? <laughs> My word. I was on a learning curve, and in that first meeting, at a prayer meeting, there was an opportunity through the meeting, so many young converts like what's happening here in this church, and they're being trained and taught and counseled and advised and helped by f spiritual fathers, and that's a great privilege. There was an opportunity given to give a testimony, and I was one of the first on my feet. 
If that testimony had been recorded, I wouldn't have understood a word of it, although it came out of my mouth, because I was a very fast speaker, and I was very nervous. And then there was a time of prayer, and for the first time in my life, publicly, I prayed. You know, I was so glad I started at the very beginning. Didn't wait for weeks and months until I kind of got used or got trained or memorized. I started right at the beginning. It's always easier when you start right at the beginning. You don't have to preach a sermon. Just, just a few words calling God Father, telling Him that you love Him and thanking Him for saving you and changing your direction. And that's how it was. And the prayer meeting became my uh, weekly routine. I was busy on the farm, but as time passed, I was attending, like you're doing here, three prayer meetings every week, one of which I cycled 14 miles there and back. I remember being busy in the farm and arriving one evening when uh, they were all coming out of the prayer meeting. I came late, but when they saw me coming, they said, we can't disappoint them, and they all turned around and they went back in. And they allowed me to pray, and then the prayer meeting was officially over. Can you imagine? God poured upon this poor man, then a teenager, a spirit of prayer. I used to go to the woods and pray. I used to like praying out loud. I didn't realize that although the woods was quite some distance from our house, my family could hear me praying. And my mother confronted me. She says, are you mad or something? What, what do you do? Praying out loud, making a, a fool out of yourself. Didn't realize I was drawing attention, but my heart was full of prayer. There wasn't an outhouse on our farmyard, or a corner of an outhouse, where I hadn't prayed many times. There wasn't a field on our farm or a corner of a field that I hadn't prayed in many times. I loved to talk to my Heavenly Father, and that has stayed with me over all of my life. I'm not saying these things to you today to make a kind of a celebrity out of myself. I'm saying to you, if you're really, really born again, you will want to pray. And if the devil puts you in a cage or puts a big uh, 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 stone on top of you, you'll pray from that cage or you'll pray from under that stone. You'll not be able, you'll want to express what's in here. And that's how I was. I remember I would stop on my way home from the village, leave my bicycle in a gap, and I'd climb over a few hedges. I'd get a quiet place. I wanted to be alone with God, no matter who was listening. But I knew that God was listening, clearly. I told you that my father was a rough man, and a hard man. I was brought up with a very severe, harsh, hard work ethic. I was doing a man's work as a boy. That's why you suffer my handshake when you're going out the door every night. My wife told me tonight coming, she said, be, be gentle with the ladies. Uh, it's not intentional, it's just how I am. I held the steering wheel of a tractor too long and that's why my hands grew so large. But my father would very often in the morning rush into my room and find me on my knees praying. And he would grab a hold of me by the back of the neck and by the seat of my pants, and he'd throw me down the stairs on my head. He says, you ought to be out doing your work and not wasting your time there, whatever you're doing. 
And sometimes I would hear him coming, and I'd quickly slip up the window from an up, upstairs bedroom, and I'd jump out the window to escape his wrath. But nothing, nothing, nothing could stop me. And my father used to say to me, you know, I'm on the sick, and I don't, but I'm going to work. I don't want you to tell anybody. If anybody comes around the place, you, you mustn't be telling them where I am. I said, Father, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Now, think about it. I used to be an inveterate liar. I said, Father, I will not be covering up for you or telling lies. And he reached for the pitchfork, and he, t he, he rushed at me, and I turned to my heels, and I'm so glad I was faster on my feet than he was. I jumped over a bank, and I escaped his wrath. I think he would have... Um, He would have killed me that morning. I say to you, young people, don't be angry, don't, be, don't complain if you get it tough. Because you know what's happening? God is giving you back, boom. God is strengthening your spiritual muscles. You don't know what's up ahead. He's preparing you for something. Uh, so don't you be complaining. Don't you be saying it's hard. Let me tell you that there are millions of Muslims coming to know Jesus in Africa at the present time. And every day, every day, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them, shedding their own blood in giving testimony for their love of Christ. Thousands are dying every week on confession of faith, or being found reading the Bible. And I know some of them personally. I know some of them personally. I speak the truth, I lie not. You will not die, but God will make you strong. And I want you to, te to tell you that things are going to be harder from now on than they've been up to now. Going to be harder being a Christian at school going to be harder being a Christian at university, going to be harder to work in a factory. It's going to be harder getting a job because they'll start asking you, do you believe in God? Or are you one of these born-again people? We don't want you. <laughs> are you hearing me? And some of you who are going to go into Christian work, it's going to be more tough, more tough. I'm thinking about retirement, but I can't find the button. I don't think it was, I was made with one uh, to retire. But I'm saying, you're starting. It's going to be tough. And some of us here are going to end up in prison. And some of us, some of us are going to be slain for the gospel before Jesus comes back. Uh, you say you're crazy. Now you're really spoiling things, am I? Wait and see. Wait and see. But God's going to work. And there's going to be an awakening. Hallelujah. And the power of God is going to come. Burn up there. It's going to come in answer to the prayers and the tears and the weepings and the fastings and the sacrifices of the saints. God is going to come in power. Yeah. And thousands are going to get saved. Hallelujah. And if you want to be a part of that, you make sure you're part of the praying and paying the price. The day I met Jesus, on the second day of March, in the year of our Lord, 1966, I fell in love with Jesus. I wanted to be like him. What is Jesus like? He's holy. That's what he's like. He's holy. And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to live a clean life. I wanted to keep us as far away from the world and compromise and sin and those things I talked about a little earlier. I wanted to live right. I wanted to speak the truth. I wanted to tell it like it was. I didn't want to touch anything that didn't belong to me. In fact, 
God said to me one day, Gilbert, have you read that word? God requires that which is past. What about all those things that you stole? I said, Lord, what about it? He says, you need to pay up. You need to sort out your past where you can. I said, Lord, really? How can I ever do that? I have no money, Lord. And the Lord said, what do you own? I said, not much. I said, I have a watch. Only worth a few bob. I have a wallet, <laughs> nothing in it. I have a pair of football boots and a few other things. The Lord said, sell them. Make a start at restitution. And why? I didn't realize the things I had were worth so much money. The Lord, I think, gave me three or four times the price they were worth. And I began to pay back those who had very small, small, small. And then my grandfather said he wanted to see me. He's quite an old man at this time. He says, Gilbert, he said, I've been thinking about you, and I want to give you a pound out of my pension every week. Now, way back in the 60s, that was worth quite a bit. That was the time of the 10 shilling note, I think. It was. Every, every week. And everybody wondered, well, what, what, are you, what are you doing with that money you're getting? I was making restitution. My parents gave me money to buy my school dinner. I used to stash it away on top of an old overmantel. A half crown and the two, the two shilling pieces. We called them florins. And every now and then I'd get them down and count them. And then I'd be off. I remember I stole a watch from a man away in Temple. The Lord told me, it's time you put that right. I remember getting on a bicycle after I did my farm chores. Uh, it was a hot summer's day, and I remember cyc cycling over <clears throat> uh, Carmore, Ashnadara, on my old bike. And why, when I was halfway up that old mountain, I thought, am I crazy or something? I'll never, I'll never make this journey. I thought that, but I kept going, and I landed in Brookboro. I think I was going the wrong way, don't you? from Fosley, but I landed in Brookborough, and I found my man in a pub, and I said, I need to talk to you. I said, you remember that watch that disappeared from your house? I said, I, I, I was the culprit. I stole it, and I have bought a new watch, and here it is. He says, my word, I lost the watch, but I never suspected you. I made an impression, and there were a lot of people I had to pay debts to. And for three years, when I got down on my knees, I was looking at the Lord, and this thing would pop up, and this thing would pop up, and this thing would pop up, and I got no peace until I paid up, sorted it out. And I reached a point where when I got down to pray, there was nothing between me and Jesus. And I say to you young people, if you've done wrong things, you put them right. You make apology. You, you do your part, your part. I was going around the countryside to confess to farmers I'd raided their orchards. You say that's going too far. I say if God puts his finger upon it, you haven't gone far enough until you put that right. Now, sometimes God deals with each of us differently. That's the way he dealt with me. I got peace. How much is peace worth? Any price to get peace. And that's where I arrived. I fell in love with Jesus, wanted to be like him. And right there, at the very beginning of my Christian journey, I felt a call upon my life. I couldn't really explain it, but I felt... I want, I want to do something to help others to find Jesus. I, I, want, I want to preach. Now, I wondered how on earth 
could I ever, ever start? What do you do to start anyway to be a preacher? Uh, how do you begin on a journey like this? And God showed me um, that I needed to wait, that I needed to be a diligent student of the Bible. I needed to go through with Him. I needed to surrender my life to Him. That was a big issue. Remember having heard a message about yielding my life, putting my life on the altar. That's the way the preacher put it in the wee hall. Putting your life on the altar. That was a, an expression taken from the Old Testament when uh, the, the, the Jews would make a sacrifice and they would bring the sacrifice to the altar and it would be slain and it would be offered up as a sacrifice to God. And I remember one day being so overwhelmed doing my work. I rushed into the house and I ran up the stairs and I fell on my face before God. I said, Lord, whatever it means, I want you to have all that there is of me. I don't want to hold anything back. I want your power in my life. I want to be a holy man of God. I want you to use me in whatever way you, you seem, see fit. And I really meant it. Never use words when you're talking to God that you don't mean. Never say anything to Jesus that you're giving to Him or you're willing to do for Him if you don't mean it. I meant it. I would have died for him back then. And I still feel the same way. And I wonder, I wonder, will I get out of this world without dying for him? I'm on his altar for life or for death or for whatever he sees good. I knew God had a plan. I knew that he had a work for me to do. And I remember uh, one morning, one evening actually, coming home from a prayer meeting. It was 11 o'clock and the house was quiet. Everybody had gone to bed. And I knelt down at the old stove. And the fire had burned low. It was almost out. And I opened my Bible. Now I said, Lord, you've been talking to me for a long time about the faith mission. It almost seemed it was the only organization besides the Irish evangelistic band that I knew about or had heard about. Well, I'd heard about a lot of foreign missionary societies. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm now 17. I said, Lord, is your call on my life? Are you looking for me, wanting me to serve you in this way? I said, Lord, if that is the way, I said, I want you to talk to me tonight about it. And just opening the scriptures, I remembered I'd, I'd, I'd been reading through the early chapters of Genesis. I'd got to chapter 12. And I remember my eyes immediately fell on the first verses of chapter 12. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and I will bless thee and thou shalt be a blessing. You know what? The very God that spoke those words to the old patriarch, Abraham, he spoke the very same words to me. And I was so sure about it. I had heard the voice of God. I had heard the call of God that night. I says, Lord, I hear you. And I say, Amen. I've been waiting for that for a long time. Amen, I said. But I said, Lord, you know the situation I'm in here? I said, Lord, my father's a hard man, and I don't know how I'll, I'll get out of here. But I said, Lord, you need to give me another confirmation. You need to give me another seal. Lord, show me from your word. And I don't recommend you doing what I did. I opened the Bible at random. I said, Lord, Give me a seal. And I read, And thou shalt go in the strength of the Lord God and make mention of my name, of mine only. I said, Lord, that touches me. I said, Lord, 
That's as good as it gets. Thank you. Amen. You'll be thinking now that I was doubting Thomas. Not really. I was a cousin of Gideon. I said, Lord, I need another seal. I said, you know, Lord, if I move, I need to get it clear. I need, I need, I need all the evidence I can get. I said, Lord, I want to ask you for a sign now. I said, Lord, if you really want me to go in this direction that I hear you calling me in, I said, Lord, give me one soul. Allow me to lead one soul to Jesus at school before the summer holidays. And I said, thank you, Lord. And I went to bed after I'd prayed a bit more. And the next morning, I was no sooner in school, this young man came to me and said, Gilbert, you were talking to me the other day about getting saved, giving my life to Christ. He says, I just want you to know I give my life to Christ. I got saved. And I'm so happy. I said, Lord, thank you. I remember where I was when that young fellow came to me. I was in the science laboratory. I said, thank you, Lord. That's so clear. Let me tell you that within less than 18 months, I was in Bible college. I remember getting up very early that morning. In fact, during the intervening months, um, a friend had wrote to me. I'd shared it with him that God has called me, and he wrote back, and he said, um, good news, God has called you into the FM, and um, I'll be praying for you, a young man in Scotland that I'd become acquainted with, a dear man. He died the other day of a heart attack at traffic lights in, 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 in Paisley, outside of Glasgow. <clears throat> Very godly man. And um, what never, never happened before, my mother opened the letter. She opened the letter. Never did that before. And she told my father, FM, they thought it was foreign missions, but uh, the foreign mission bit came a little later on. They didn't know that. It was a prophecy of a kind. And my father was so angry. He says, you're going nowhere. He says, I need you here. He says, you're not going anywhere. And he took his fists and he squared them up to me. He says, you're going nowhere. I said, Father, God has called me and I'm going. And he, he began to reach for me. He says, you're not, he said. I says, Father, God has called me. And I've said yes. I often wondered if God had called him. I think he made a profession in earlier years and he didn't respond. I thought, you know, it's bringing back memories, and he's very angry. And for 18 months, he squared up to me, and he threatened me, and he made promises, and, but I said, I'm going. When God calls you, you know you'll be tested. You'll be tested real good. But if you stand firm, God will honor you and bless you. And so the day came, I packed my bags. I still have the old case. It's a memorial. The date's on it. September 1970. Only I've painted an, a, an elephant on it, and I've painted an African village and a church. Well, I didn't, but somebody who was good with the brush did. So I'll never forget uh, what that case was about. So I landed. I was on my way. My mother got up, and I kissed her goodbye. My father refused. He says, you're not going to get a penny of support from me. You can forget about it. Well, it was God who called me, not my father on earth, and I knew God would provide. You're not getting a penny. So he never, never got up to say, cheerio. My mother was there, and um, she encouraged me. And the promise God gave me was, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He gave me a blank check. No, a blank check, but it was signed. Philippians 4, 19. All your need. All your need. All your need. And over the years, God has met all our needs. 
and for 15 years we have been feeding a couple of hundred children and we've been educating them and clothing them and looking after their medical expenses and doing a lot more things. And we've been building churches and orphanages in Africa. And do you know what? I've loved every minute of it and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Not anything. And my wife has been in her element also in Africa. And we've had the joy of pointing tens of thousands of souls to Jesus Christ in Africa. Hallelujah. I've preached the gospel to over a million people in Africa. We have seen the stirrings of God. That's why when I stand in the pulpit, I find it difficult to find the right place to say amen. <laughs> you don't understand. I've wearied your patience on the other nights and have done the very same tonight. But I want you to know it's real. And I don't have any regrets at what I've done. I have invested my life in the kingdom of God. And I wish I had a thousand more lives to do the same with it. Glory to God. It's getting better. It's getting better by the day. Hallelujah. He's real. He's wonderful. <laughs> He's precious. And I love him so, so, so much. But my love can't, it's not a speck by comparison of his great, great love for me and you. The Lord has called me into evangelism. He's called me separately later when my wife and I wed in 1977, called me, us into pastoral ministry where we remain for 28 years, planting and pioneering churches and building churches. Never expected to do that in Africa, but I have been doing that in Africa and now for the last 15, come 16 years, the call of God came again in a similar capacity to go, to go. I'm so sure of it, as sure as I am of my name and the size of my shoes. Hallelujah. And I want you to know, dear people here tonight, that the key to power in prayer is the Holy Ghost the key to preaching uh, with effect and impact is the Holy Ghost. The key to revival is the Holy Ghost. The key to understanding the Scriptures is the Holy Ghost. The key to living a victorious Christian life is the Holy Ghost. The key to loving your brother and your sister and your enemy is the Holy Ghost. And if you can't do it, and if you won't do it, you haven't got the Holy Ghost, or He hasn't got you. So there's no excuse. Dear people, I can't give you any better advertisement concerning getting saved tonight, if you're not saved, than I have. Are you hearing me? I cannot give you any better advertisement. You need Jesus. And tonight is the best night, the best night you could ever have of giving your life to Jesus Christ or giving your life to serve God as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a missionary. And I tell you, whatever you give to Jesus, you know what? The interest is not good in the banks these days. If you have any money, not many of us have, but if you have any, the interest not. But when you invest something for Jesus, you know he'll pay you more than a thousand percent. It doesn't get better than that. It doesn't get better than that. I've never met anybody yet in my life of serving God who regretted that they became a Christian. I've never met anybody who regretted that they surrendered their lives to serve God in full-time ministry. No. And I want to tell you, it's not a career. I hate the term, a career missionary. 
a career past, too many career pastors and career evangelists. I want to tell you it's the greatest privilege under the sun to be serving God because He looks after you. He looks after you. For sure He does. And um, He gives you the great joy. And there's no greater than kneeling beside some poor soul, some poor lost sinner, and pointing them to Jesus Christ. Oh, my dear friends. It's a wonderful life. But there's challenges. And um, there are impossible situations that you meet up with. But the Lord will never, 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 never let you down. In 55 years of knowing Jesus, 55 years and two months, the Lord Jesus has never, never, never let me down. Never come even close to it. And His promises get better by the day, and I know He'll fulfill every one of them. And I'm inviting you now to give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're out of touch with God, you're backslidden. You're not where you should be, not where you used to be. Tonight is the night. Get back to the cross. Come to Jesus, and I will kneel with you there, and I will pray with you along with Pastor Bertie. We'll lead you. We'll lead you back. And if you want power in your life, I told you where you'll find it. There's an upper room everywhere. There's an upper room here. You can get the Holy Ghost, and you can get fire in your belly, and you can get, you can get the, the dynamo and the dynamic that you need to do the work of God. Don't be making excuses. Don't think God has made a mistake when He has put His hand on your shoulder and He says, I'm calling you. I remember the night when I preached for the first time. Well, preaching, that's too elaborate a word to use. I spoke in our little prayer meeting. And there wasn't a great audience there, maybe eight or ten or twelve people. And an old man called Bobby Bowes. I don't know if Pastor Bertie remembers Bobby, the road man. But boys, did he love Jesus. He had a lovely singing voice. And he had a very sweet disposition. And I loved to hear him pray. And by the way, your best teachers and mentors in prayer are the older saints. Churches want to uh, segregate the youth from the, the adults. How on earth do you think you're going to learn to be an intercessor? How on, you, you feel it, uh, you, you're feeling kind of um, browbeaten and embarrassed. I say, the old saints. That night after I spoke, I remember Bobby coming to me. He said, Gilbert, and he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, I've heard you talking tonight. And it wasn't a very eloquent message, by the way. It wasn't just as long as some of the ones I've been giving lately. He said, I believe God has something for you, Gilbert. I didn't know that night where God would take me and what he'd do. But he had a plan, and he has a plan for your life.